Good morning. Good morning, family. Wow, it is so good to be here. Everybody stay standing, and I do want to challenge that last comment about the best in golf. But anyway, that is another issue. I am so happy to be here because I believe you have one of the finest pastors in the United States, and Pastor Joe and Pastor Lori Champion. Seriously, um, we always joke with them. We always say that Joe is the, uh, the male Lisa Bevere and that I'm the male Lori Champion. Uh, but they are just absolutely amazing. I'm so glad they're actually in my father's parents' hometown of Caserta, Italy. That is where my entire father's family came from. And you're starting a church there. How about that connection? I love that. Amen. And so I just want to say that, you know, when I, when I first went in ministry, I used to look at how big the church was or the conference was. Not anymore. I look at the children, and I look at, I look at Connor. I look at the, the three sons of Joe and Lori Champion, such men of God, great men of God. My children love them. And so you really are in a safe place. And I think that's one of my jobs as an uncle here is me to come and tell you thank you for being a part of Celebration. Now, I know some of you don't know me very well. I think the best way to introduce myself is through my family. And so this is a recent snapshot of my family. This was last July. Our, our final son got married. And uh, Lisa and I have been married 41 years this year. She is my absolute best friend on the planet. And it's so fun to be able to sit there this morning and watch her on the uh, advert, the church news. Uh, but those are our four sons and our four daughter-in-laws and our G-babies. All of our sons and daughter-in-laws have worked with us at Messenger International, our G-babies. What do you say? You say, what's a G-baby? I am way too young to be grandpa, so it's G-daddy and G for short. But you can see Christian is holding her tummy there. There was another one born right after this wedding, and his name is Azariah, and he really does look Italian. And so I'm going to preach better now because I saw all the, my G-babies. So anyway, that's my family, and the more I love them, the more I realize how much God loves us because we're his big, big family. Can you say amen? amen. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a lot more than a message. It is a burden, a burden I've carried for the American church for years and years and years. I've finally written a book on it. It's called The Awe of God. It just came out two weeks ago. It actually hit the bestseller list this week in America. But it, it shows me that America is really hungry for a move of God. When a move of God comes, we can find ourselves in one of three places. We can be fighting against it. We can be on the outside looking in, or we can be on the cutting edge. And it's beginning to happen. God spoke to me at the beginning of the year and said, the sprinklings of this great outpouring of my spirit is about to occur this year. And we are seeing just the drizzle of it with Asbury and the other places where revival is breaking out. I want to prepare this church that I love so much to be ready for this outpouring of God's spirit. Amen. And so I believe this message, God showed me that one of the emphasis of the final move of his spirit before Jesus returns would be on the holy awe of God. And I want to share with you about that this morning. Now, I will say this. I could be one of the best communicators on the planet. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't anoint these words, we're just getting information. What we need is transformation. And I want to ask you, how many of you believe God can change your life in one service? Put your hand up and put the other hand up because we won't have unless we ask. Amen. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. And first and foremost, thanks for allowing us to be your children. You could have made us slaves and we would have been better off than where we were. But you called us sons and daughters. Today, Holy Spirit of God, invade this sanctuary. Do what you love to do the most. Reveal Jesus to us in a way like we've never seen him before. As you do this, may we go from glory to glory from strength to strength, and from faith to faith. For I decree that your kingdom has come. Your will shall be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. And for this, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, and the thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name that we pray. And everybody that agrees shouts. Amen. Come on, give him praise for what he's going to do. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord God. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. I'm going to ask you to do something that is a little unusual. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I want to share some things with you, and I don't want you to be distracted. I want you to listen carefully to these questions that I'm going to ask you. What if you were told of a hidden virtue 
that in essence is the key to all of life. It unlocks the purpose of your existence. It attracts the presence, the provision, and the protection of your creator. It is the root of all noble character. It is the foundation of all true happiness. It provides the needest, needed adjustments to all in harmonious and, uh, I would say, inharmonious and chaotic circumstances you might face. To firmly embrace this virtue would guarantee, now listen to these words, success, safety, good health, long life, and a noble legacy. You can open your eyes now. Some of you are probably thinking, uh-uh, this is fiction. It is not fiction. I assure you every word that I spoke is true, and it was written by one of the most successful men that have ever walked the earth. And in fact, he was not only writing these words, but he was anointed to write these words by our creator. And that man was King Solomon. This virtue that I speak about, he embraced it. It's called godly fear as a young man. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and he ruled his nation in a profound way. So successful was he that the Bible says that every single family in his nation had a home and a garden. I want you to think about a nation that there is nobody renting, there's nobody on unemployment or on welfare. So successful is this man that kings and queens come from all over the world, nobles and ambassadors, just to get a glimpse of how he was running his nation. But he did not treasure this virtue called godly fear, and he let it slip away. And when he let it slip away, we get a gift. What is that gift? It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, there are two books that Christians avoid reading, the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. Why? They are two inspired books written by two uninspired men. Solomon writes these things. These are actually direct quotes from the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is boring, utterly boring. No one can find any meaning in it. History merely repeats itself as there's nothing new under the sun. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. The day you die? is better than the day you're born? Okay, who writes these words? I will tell you who writes, a pessimistic cynic, a man who has a very jaded outlook on life. Solomon went to the depths of despair, despondency, and believe me, I have seen this in our day. I have seen people that have been in ministry from years with this kind of an attitude. Why? Because they lost the holy fear of God, but Towards the end of his life, Solomon recovers this virtue. And he writes seven times in one form or another in the very last chapter of this book, Remember Your Creator. And then he writes these final words in this book, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Isaiah 33 verse 6 tells us that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. I want you to stop and think about God's treasure. What do we do with treasure? We protect it. We hire security systems. We put it in safes and vaults. It is not only God's treasure, it is to be our treasure. Yet I find many people don't even know what it is. Let me start out by saying this. The fear of the Lord has absolutely nothing to do with being scared of God. How can we have a relationship of intimacy with somebody that we, we are scared of? And yet this is God's desire, is to be intimate with every single one of us. When Moses delivered Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to the mountain that he met with God. If you will remember, Israel is abused by Egypt. Their children are put to death, they have stripes on their back, they work all their life building somebody else's inheritance. Yet the children of Israel came out of Egypt and constantly said it was better for us back in Egypt. We want to go back. Moses was raised in the most beautiful home on the planet. His grandfather, Pharaoh, is the wealthiest man on earth. 
He could do anything he wanted. He could throw a party whenever he wanted, a national party. He could have every Ferrari in the collection. But yet he comes out of Egypt and he never once says, I want to go back. Why? He had one encounter with God at that bush and he wants Israel to have the same encounter. That's why when he brings them out of Egypt, he doesn't bring them first to the promised land. He brings them to the mountain where he met with God. And God said to him, my whole reason for delivering Israel out of Egypt was to bring them to myself. I want to have a relationship. I have called them all to be a kingdom of priests. And a priest is somebody that can approach God for himself or herself or somebody else. But yet when God came down on the mountain, all the people ran away. And when they ran away, Moses was shocked. And Moses made this statement. He said, do not fear. Everybody say, do not fear. Because God has come to test you. What's the test? To see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is Moses contradicting himself? Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you? No, he is differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. There's such a difference. The person that is scared of God is something to hide. What does Adam do when he sins? He hides from the presence of the Lord. The person who fears God is terrified of being away from God. So if you want your first definition of the holy fear of God, it is to be terrified of being away from him. So what is the fear of the Lord? It is when we stand in awe of him. It's when we honor, tremble, revere, esteem, respect, value, and venerate him more than anything or anyone else. What is important to him becomes important to us. What is not so important to him is not so important to us. So we literally embrace his heart and we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. You say, God hates? Yes, he hates. Now let me pr protect you from the legalistic view of the fear of the Lord. Have you ever heard maybe somebody say and it caused you to cringe, I fear God, that's why I hate those sinners. No, you don't fear God at all because you hate what he loves. God loves those sinners so much he died for them. What he hates is the sin that's unmaking them. So I remember back in the day, my early days of ministry, it was the early 1990s, I was praying two hours every single morning. But yet when I would stand up and preach, my words did not carry authority. And it frustrated me. And one day I, I cried out and I said, God, why isn't there a stronger anointing on my life to preach the gospel? It seems like my words are weak. They're not changing lives. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, son, because you tolerate sin. I said, what? He said, you tolerate sin. And he said, read Hebrews 1. And I went over to Hebrews 1 and it's when God the Father inaugurates Jesus as king of the universe. And look what God the Father says to Jesus. He says, because you have loved righteousness and hated sin. And he said, stop. Every Christian loves righteousness. But I didn't stop there. I said, and hated sin. Therefore, God, even your God has anointed you beyond your companions. He said, you learn to hate sin the way I hate sin, and you'll see the anointing of God increase upon your life. So the fear of the Lord doesn't dislike sin, it hates it, because it unmakes who he loves. Are you with me? So if you wanna put the fear of the Lord or the holy awe of God in two categories, you can do it. Category number one is to tremble at his presence. Category number two is to tremble at his word. God makes, let's look at category one. God makes the statement through the prophet Jeremiah. Do you not fear me? Will you not tremble at my presence? Paul makes the statement in the book of Philippians in the New Testament. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You don't work out your salvation. You don't mature your salvation through love and kindness. You mature it through fear and trembling. So what does it mean to tremble at his presence? Psalm 89 verse 7 makes the statement, God is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Now look at the second part. God is to be held in reverence by all those 
who surround him. Write this down. You will never find God in an atmosphere where he is not held with the utmost of respect. Let me tell you when I first learned this, back in 1997, I was asked to do a national conference in Brazil. It was a massive conference. And I was so excited, my first time in the nation. And that night they drive me, it was Friday night, they drive me to the arena. It's not an auditorium, it's an arena. Thousands of Brazilians, there wasn't a seat open in the place. And it was a believer's conference. And I walk into the arena and they put me on the platform. I was over here. This was back in the days when they used to put ministers on the platform. I hated that. But anyway, I'm, I'm in there and you would think just the energy alone of the place being jam-packed would create an atmosphere. But yet there wasn't an ounce of the presence of God. Now, what do you mean? The presence of God, not an ounce. I thought he's everywhere. Yes, he is everywhere, but there's two kinds of the presence of God. There's his omnipresence, which says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But then there's his manifest presence. Jesus said, I will manifest myself to you. That's when God reveals himself to our senses. That presence was missing in that arena. And I remember closing my eyes and I said, God, where's your presence? And I opened my eyes and I saw something that I didn't see before I asked. And that is I saw people talking to one another. I saw them with their arms crossed, looking around during the worship. Hands are in their pocket, looking down. They're walking in and out of the building. They're walking over to their friends that they see, high-fiving them, saying, hey. They, they, they're, they're, they're going out to the concession stands and getting their tacos and bringing them back. And I'm like, this will calm down, but it doesn't. Now the worship sets over, and one of the leaders comes up and begins to read from Scripture. And now because music's not playing, you can hear a low mutter of people talking to one another. And I'm like, this is crazy. And the Holy Spirit said, son, you got to deal with this. So I remember walking up to the podium and I didn't say a word after I was introduced. Like they introduced me. Here's our Friday night guest speaker, right? I walk up and just look at the people. Now, when you're the Friday night guest speaker in the national conference and you're not saying a word, that will get people's attention. And so all of a sudden, everybody stopped talking. Everybody stopped walking around. They were looking at me like, what are you doing? Just staring at us. And when I realized every eye was on me in the place, I said, I have a question. You are talking to somebody sitting across the table, and the whole time you're talking to them, they get their arms crossed looking around, or they're rolling their eyes, or they got their hands in their pocket, or they're whispering to somebody beside them. I said, will you continue to talk to them? No. And I said, I have been in this arena for an hour, over an hour, and there's not an ounce of the presence of God, because God will never come into a place where he's not held with the utmost of respect. I said, if the, president of your, if the president of your nation would have walked on this platform tonight, you would have given him 10 times the respect you did the Lord. I said, if Pele, your greatest soccer player, would have walked on this platform, you would have been on the edge of your seats anticipating every word coming out of his mouth. I said, you've given no respect to the spirit of God. And I preached him for 75 minutes on the fear of the Lord. After 75 minutes, I said, all right, you're in this place. You say you're a believer, but you lack the holy fear of God and you're willing to repent. Stand up. 75% of the arena stands to its feet. As soon as they do, the presence of God comes in. It was amazing. People start weeping, right? It was beautiful. I led them in a prayer of repentance. And I remember there was a lull, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, I'm coming one more time. Now, there is no way I can ever describe this, but I'm going to try. But I want you to imagine being at the end of the runway at Austin Airport, and a Boeing jet takes off. That kind of a violent wind came blowing into that arena. When it did, the people started screaming. Now, can you imagine thousands of Brazilians screaming? The wind was louder. And I remember I am standing there, and I'm petrified. Okay? I had never, ever experienced a presence like this. I mean, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he fell down and he's groveling on his face saying, woe is me, and he was a godly man. Because I realized daddy didn't come in, the king came in. The authority that came with that presence was terrifying, but yet I was drawn to it. I wasn't repelled by it. That's the crazy aspect of it. And I remember standing there going, Bevere, you say one wrong word, you make one wrong move, you're dead. <laughs> Would that have happened? I don't know, but it did happen with a man and a wife who came to their church in Jerusalem and gave an offering with irreverence and they buried them the same day. 
I knew irreverence wouldn't be tolerated in this presence because the king was there. And I remember that wind lasted about 90 seconds and it gradually subsided and it left in its wake. People collapsed all over the arena, weeping. And I'm like, God, what do I do? What do I do? And the Lord's like, I'm, I'm finished with you tonight. And so I said to the leader, it's all yours. And they, they whisked me out. They put me in the car. They put the national singer. She was the soloist that night with her husband in the car. She goes, did you hear the wind? Did you hear the wind? I, and I didn't want to be the first to say, I said, maybe it was a jet aircraft that flew too low over the arena. She goes, what are you talking about? I saw, and she, and she gets, starts getting mad at me. And her husband, who was calmer, said, sir, I, I know that was no jet aircraft. I said, how do you know? He said, there were security men and policemen all around the building. They're union workers. Most of them aren't even safe. When the, when the wind started blowing on the inside, they came running in to see what it was. And he said, I was at the main soundboard because I wanted to make sure my wife's singing levels were right. He said, the whole time the wind was blowing, I'm looking at the soundboard. The decimal meters are at zero. Not one ounce of the sound came through our sound system. I said, my God, take me to my hotel right now. And I, I remember I just sat on the balcony tonight, that night till 1.30 in the morning going, just worshiping. I, all I could do was worship. The next morning, you cannot believe the miracles that happened just because of reverence. God makes this statement in Leviticus 10, by those who come near me, I must, not as a good idea, I must be regarded as holy. I have learned something. I remember I used to struggle in my private prayer time to get into the presence of God. One day I thought, you know, I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to meditate on how awesome my dad is. And I started thinking about him putting the stars in the universe with his fingers and calling everyone by name, measuring the universe from his thumb to his pinky with the span of his hand, weighing every drop of water on the earth in the palm of his hands. And all of a sudden there's the presence of God. I thought, whoa, that was easy. So the next day I thought, I'm going to try that again. <laughs> Happened again. Next day, I'm gonna, I said, I'm going to try that again. It happened again. So finally, the third day, I protested. I said, hey, Lord, this is so easy to get in your presence. Where, where, where have I been missing it all these years? And the Holy Spirit said, how did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, how, oh my, there it is. Hallowed be your name. That means your name is to be kept holy. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as Holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified, God says. I was in Malaysia two years after Brazil. I'm not in an arena. I'm in an auditorium just like this. Packed. It was our 10th meeting. People had come from all over the nation of Malaysia. And I remember that presence came into that place. Except it was stronger than Brazil. There was no wind, but that presence came in. And I remember the people started erupting, screaming, like they were being baptized in fire. It was, it was amazing. And I remember this one was a little stronger, and I went, I can't handle this. This is when I found out there was a difference between my head and my heart. Because my head was going, God, I, I can't handle this. And my heart was going, God, please don't lift, please don't lift, please don't lift. There was literally an argument going on. And I remember I'm just, I'm just standing there, and there's like goosebumps on my goosebumps. And once again, I think, Bavir, you say one wrong word, you're dead. And I remember just walking very cautiously on the platform and out of my mouth came these words that my mind had never thought of before. Out of my mouth came these words. This is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I went inside, I went, that's it. That's one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Because remember Isaiah 11 says, the spirit of the Lord would rest upon Jesus. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And look at the next statement. Jesus is delight. His delight. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And I'm, I'm, I remember that, that, that manifestation lasted about five minutes, a little longer in Brazil. And I remember the, the, the leader got up. Once again, the Lord said, I'm through with you. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, it's funny, but not funny. You know what I'm saying. So the leader walks up and goes, you know, we'd normally end with a song right now, but we can't end with a song. Just stay here as long as you want. And I remember I stayed for quite a while and so did everybody. Nobody left. And I'm finally walking out and this Indian couple stops me right in the aisle as I'm walking out. And we're just looking at each other. What do you say after something like this? And we're just staring at each other. And finally she, she says this, she makes this statement, the woman from India. She goes, I feel so clean inside. I said, okay. 
that perfectly describes what I sensed in Brazil, California, North Carolina, now here. This only happened like four or five times in my life. Clean. I went back to my hotel and I thought, clean, that's it. I feel so clean. So the next morning I'm getting ready to play basketball with the Bible school students in Malaysia. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me and said, son, read Psalm 19. Now, I have absolutely no idea what's in Psalm 19. So I go over to Psalm 19. I start reading verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then I get to verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. I went, whoa, there it is. And then look at the words, enduring forever. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that hotel room. And he said, son, Lucifer led worship right before my throne. He beheld my glory. He was anointed to worship me. He didn't fear me. He didn't endure forever as worship leader. A third of the angels surrounded my throne, son. They beheld my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in heaven forever because a third of the angels were cast out of heaven like lightning. He said, Adam and Eve walked in the presence of my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in the garden forever. And he said, son, every created being that surrounds my throne will be tested in the holy fear of God. Then I started thinking afterwards, there are pastors, ministers that have started in ministry, excited, excited to help people, passionate to serve God, but they didn't endure in ministry forever. Barna has told us that over 40 million Americans have walked away from the faith in the last 23 years. 40 million That's more than one-tenth of the population in the United States. Why? Could it be because we're not teaching them on what matures our salvation? Fear and trembling? Could it be that we've omitted one of the most important things, what Jesus delighted in, God's treasure, we've omitted from talking about it? The fear of the Lord is also manifested by trembling at God's word. Israel was at a point in their history where they were selectively obeying God. Do you understand what I just said, selectively? And so God said, your selective obedience is like offering pig's blood to me. And for a Jew, that's pretty serious. And then God says, but this is the one I will pay attention to. On him who is humble, and contrite, and who trembles at my word. Trembling at the word of God is a manifestation of holy fear. What does it mean to tremble at God's word? It means we obey God instantly. David makes the statement in Psalm 119, I will hurry to obey your commands. You ever meet somebody that says, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me about this now for several months. And then they laugh about it. I'm like, you're laughing about your lack of holy fear? Sure, it's quiet in this Methodist church. Are you still here? <laughs> I need to get you to breathe. <laughs> Number two, it means you'll obey God even if it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to forgive somebody who's hurt you? Does it make sense to walk around city walls for six days silently and then blow a ram's horn and watch the most powerful nation get taken down? Does it make sense to tell skilled sailors to stay on the ship that's sinking when there's lifeboats, but yet everybody who stayed on the ship was saved? Does it make sense to bless those that are cursing you? To tremble at God's word means we'll obey him even if it hurts. The Bible says that Jesus obeyed God even to the point of death. And Peter writes, as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Religion seeks out suffering to please the God, little g, it serves. True Christianity says, I will obey God no matter the suffering I face in a lost and dying world. It means, number four, you'll obey God even if you don't see a benefit. Unfortunately, one of the only ways we can get Westerners to obey God nowadays is to tell them the benefit of obeying him. If you give, God will do this. If you pray, God will do this. If you serve, God will do this. 
What if Esther would have bought into that? She's queen to the most powerful king on the planet. Nobody knows she's a Jew, but all the Jews are about to be annihilated. And she looks at her cousin and says, I'm going before the king. And if he cuts my head off, I die. She had nothing, absolutely nothing to gain and everything to lose, including her head. But she feared God. Number five, it means you'll obey God to completion. King Saul does 99.99% of what God had told him to do, but yet God said he has disobeyed me. That's because almost complete obedience is not obedience. Now, I want to get to the benefits of fearing God. Would you, want, would you like to hear some of the benefits? These are the promised rewards for those who stand in awe of God. Number one, friendship with God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning, and that word beginning means starting place of knowing God intimately. God says, you can't even know me intimately until you fear me. Psalm 25 verse 14 makes this statement, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. Now that word secret actually in the Hebrew means secrets. So the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. Do you have secrets? Absolutely every one of us have secrets. Not all secrets are bad. Who do you share your secrets with? Intimate, close friends, or acquaintances? Answer me. Intimate, close friends. God's no different. God says, I share my secrets with my intimate, close friends. And by the way, my intimate, close friends are those who fear me. Let me prove to you, I'm not taking this out of context. Let me show you the New Living Translation of the same verse. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them, he shares the secrets. What is God saying here? Not everybody in the church is my friend. Did you hear what I just said? Who is the first person that is called the friend of God in the Bible? Abraham. Why is Abraham the friend of God? Because when Abraham's old, God comes to him one night and says, Abe. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Abe, you know your son who you love more than anything or anyone else, who you waited for for 24 years, that, 25 years, that I promised you, I want you to go on a three-day journey and kill him for me. That's all he said. He doesn't say, if you go do this, I'll send my son. He doesn't say, he just says, go sacrifice him. And, and Abraham doesn't have Genesis to read. <laughs> okay? Like, he doesn't go to chapter 22 and find out, oh, this is going to happen. Yeah, I'll go do it. <laughs> so what does the Bible say? Early the next morning. <laughs> the next morning, right after God speaks to him. Early the next morning, he is packed up with two servants with his son, and he's on his way. Now, it's easier when you heard the booming voice of God the night before, but what about two and a half days later when you're looking at the mountain, you're going to put the most important person or thing to death in your life just because God said do it and didn't give you a reason. Abraham goes to the top, builds the altar. Can you imagine the emotions surging? I've waited 25 years for this young man. I've already sent Ishmael away. What is going on? But he builds the altar, he ties up Isaac, he lifts the knife, and an angel appears. And the angel says, Abraham, stop. Look at this. Because now I know that you fear God. How does the angel know that Abraham feared God? Because he obeyed instantly. Because he obeyed when it didn't make sense. Because he obeyed when it hurt. Because he obeyed when he didn't see a benefit. And because he obeyed to completion. Abraham puts down the knife, unties Isaac. He sees a ram caught in the thicket, and out of his spirit comes Jehovah, Jireh. God just revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham nobody had ever known before because he's my friend. You're not getting this. Okay, all of you know me as John Bevere preacher. Some of you know me as John Bevere author, but there is a lady, and whoa, she is a lady. I showed you her picture. She knows me as John Bevere dad, John Bevere G-daddy, John Bevere athlete, John Bevere best friend. She knows me as John Bevere husband. Can I say this? None of you will ever know me as John Bevere husband. That is a facet that is reserved for her and her only, because she's the closest person to me on earth. Amen? Yeah, you can clap about that one. God revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham nobody had ever known before, because he's my friend. Now, look at the relationship between God and Abraham. It's amazing. One day the Lord says, should we do to Sodom and Gomorrah 
what we're planning on doing without first talking to our friend Abraham. So the Lord comes out and says, Abe, Abe, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 Lord. Abe, uh, we're thinking about blowing up these two cities. What do you think? <laughs> Abe goes, Sodom? And the Lord goes, yeah, 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 and Gomorrah. What do you think? Now Abe goes, think, 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 think. My nephew's over there. Lot's over there. Okay, Lord, you would like blow up the two cities if there was 50 righteous people. And the Lord goes, excellent idea. Excellent idea. Okay, we'll not blow up the cities. If there's 50 righteous people. Glad we talked to our friend Abraham. Abraham goes, what if there isn't 50? Okay, what about 45? Would you blow up if there's 45? The Lord goes, another good idea. And he talks him all the way down to 10. He figures there's got to be 10. Lot's one. All he needs is nine others. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah is buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planting, and harvesting. What is that in today's vernacular? The economy's booming. Wall Street's healthy. Life is great. And if there's a God, he doesn't mind our lifestyle. They're 24 hours away from being obliterated, and they're clueless. That's not scary. This is what's scary. Lot, who the Bible calls righteous. I'm going to put it in today's terminology. Saved. Born again, Christian. He is 24 hours away from being obliterated. He's as clueless as Sodom. It takes two angels of mercy because Abraham prayed. Thank God Abraham prayed to get him out. Now, here's two righteous men. Two saved men. Two born again men. I'm going to put it in today's terminology. This righteous saved born again man knows what God's going to do before he does it and helps God decide how he's going to do it. This righteous saved born again man is as clueless as the world. Why? This righteous, say, born-again man fears God. Therefore, he's the friend of God. Therefore, God shares his secrets with him. This righteous, say, born-again man does not fear God. Therefore, he's not the friend of God. So he doesn't get the secrets. Jesus made a statement in John 15, 14 that we never finished the sentence. He said, you are my friends if... If is a condition. You have to fulfill the condition before this applies. What is the condition? If you do whatever I command you. There it is, trembling, the awe of God, trembling at his word. Jesus is saying, not everybody in the church is my friend, but he passionately desires everybody in the church to be his friend. But the fear of the Lord is the starting place of a true friendship with God. You still with me? Second benefit, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Joyful? They delight? Okay, stop and listen. How can you have two people? They both go to church. One person, it is a delight to obey God. The other person, it's a drag. What's the difference? Philippians 2. Listen to the words, as you have obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Listen to the word obeyed. Now, it's easy to obey God when you're in the middle of this presence of God in celebration church. What about 11 o'clock on Wednesday night when you're surfing the web for work and you come across a porn site? Are you going to engage or are you going to obey? Okay, let's, let's talk about this. As you have obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will what is will? Delight. So the fear of the Lord actually gives you a delight, a passion to want to obey God, where the other person goes, that's a drag. Still with me? Okay. You'll have a blessed posterity. What do I mean by a blessed posterity? This is in verse 2. How joyful are those that fear the Lord? Their children will be successful everywhere. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. That word entire generation means for generations to come. Simeon said that when he blessed Jesus, he said his mercy is on those who fear him, not who love him. I remember a world famous evangelist was in prison and he looked at me and he said, I loved Jesus the whole time. I didn't fear him. And he said, there are millions of Americans like me. They love Jesus, but they have no fear of God. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. There was a guy named Richard Dugdale. In 1860, he went to 12 prisons in upper state New York, and he found seven men related to each other. He was a sociologist, Richard Dugdale. So he does a deep dive on these guys' gene uh, these guys' genealogy. 
He finds out that all these men go back to a guy that he gave a fictitious name of Max Jukes to. Max Jukes was born around 1720. He was a very ungodly man. And they discovered 540 of Max Jukes' descendants. Let's, let's take a look at the 540. 310 died as paupers. 140 convicted criminals, seven of them were murderers, 18 brothel keepers, 440 alcohol to, alcoholics, and 128 prostitutes. There was another man that was born around 1720. His name was Jonathan Edwards. He's the one who wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He's the one that married Sarah Pierreport, and the two had 11 children, and they said every home is a church. They laid hands on their kids every day. They read the word of God to their kids. They did a study on his descendants of 1,394 descendants, there were 13 university presidents, 65 professors, three United States senators, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 officers, 100 preachers, and 60 authors of prominence, one vice president of the United States, and 80 became public officials in one form or another. There's the difference between the fear of God, the awe of God, and somebody who doesn't have the awe of God. Now I want to go to the final. Oh, well, I got to say this. The fear of the Lord is what eliminates all other fears, including the fear of man. I want to just look at Oswald Chambers' quote. He said, when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everyone else or in everything else. I want to look at the fifth one, and I, this is all I have time for. There's over 40 promises that I talk about in the book. Wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the starting place for wisdom. All right, now, I want to show you something interesting. I want to go right to Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain. That word fountain in the Hebrew means a continual flowing source. The emphasis being it's a nonstop flow. It's a fountain of life to turn one away from the traps of death. Death comes in traps. Now, if you've hunted before by trapping, you know that a good trap has to be camouflaged and baited. Correct? In other words, it's not obvious. A trap doesn't say, I am here to kill you. It is camouflaged and it is hidden. Death is camouflaged. Death is hidden. The fear of the Lord is a continual flow of, of life. Now, what kind of life? It tells us in, in 1533, go ahead and hit the button, it's the instruction of wisdom. So putting those two scriptures together, what are we getting here? We are getting that the fear of the Lord, holy fear or holy awe, is a fountain, a continual flow. Go to the next button, guys. A continual flow of instruction of God's wisdom. It turns us away from the traps of death. Can I illustrate this? I'm going to share a man who had no relationship with God, but he feared God. His name is King Abimelech of Gear. Abraham comes into his nation. Abraham presents his absolutely gorgeous wife as his sister. Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem. God comes to Abimelech in a dream and he says, you are a dead man because the woman you have is somebody else's wife. Abimelech's response, Lord, I didn't know she was presented to me as his sister. Look what God said to Abimelech. I know you are innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I didn't let you touch her. The fear of the Lord was a fountain, a continual flow of wisdom that kept him from touching what was baited and trapped, what was baited and camouflaged. And he didn't even have a relationship with God. Now, can you ask, can you answer this question? How can a man sit in church for 20 years, hear his pastor preach the word of God, and end up in bed with another man's wife? It's not rocket science. It's called a lack of godly fear. How does a pastor or a minister preach the word of God on a regular basis and end up in bed with another man's wife? It's not rocket science. It's a lack of the fear of the Lord. This is why we've lost 40 million Americans. And let me tell you something. 2 Thessalonians tells us, chapter 2, verse 3, 
that before Jesus returns, there was going to be a great falling away from the faith. We're in it. But here's what's really cool. Is nowhere does Paul say that they wouldn't come back. And just as John the Baptist was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, I believe there's an army of men and women that are going to go after the lost sheep of the church. And we're going to see them come home. I'm going to end it, end it with this, and that is Philippians 2, 12, and 13 out of the Passion Translation. Guys, it's the very last slide. Live in holy awe of God, which brings you trembling into his presence. God will continually revitalize you, implanting within you the passion to do what pleases him. That's what gives you the passion to delight in doing his will. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I preach what you've commanded me to preach, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, for confirming what has been spoken. I am asking that you would baptize us in the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord, Father. If you're in here and you say, John, I, I, I was brought here by a friend. I really don't go to church uh, or I just kind of wandered into this place. Or you may say, I do attend church, but I, I really don't have an authentic, close relationship with God. I want to give you an opportunity right now to enter into that relationship. <clears throat> it's not by a formula prayer. Paul the Apostle makes a statement. He says, a man leaves a father and mother, and he's joined to his wife, and the two become one. And he said, this is actually an illustration. God gave us an illustration of how the church and Jesus are one. So we got an illustration we see every day how a man and a woman become one through holy, through the covenant of holy marriage. Jesus is called the groom, we're called the bride. Now when a bride walks down the aisle of a church, she's got that beautiful white gown on, the wedding march is playing, she's actually making a pretty strong statement. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying, this is the one and only man I'm giving the rest of my life to. When Lisa did that 41 years ago with me, I would not have married her if she said, you know, Tony was my high school sweetheart. Can I have a few nights a year to jump in bed with him? Peter was, I was pinned to Peter in college. Can Peter and I have a week a year? And I, but I'll love you the most. I'll give you most of the nights a year. You know, I'll spend the majority of my time with you. I never would have done it. Do you think the groom Jesus who gave everything, everything, everything. He left what you can't even imagine and I can't even imagine yet. He came to this earth, he who created us, knowing he would be despised, rejected, lied about. He'd be spit on in the face. He'd be slapped. He'd be slugged in the face. He'd have his beard plucked out. He'd have thorns shoved into his skull. He would be scourged so beaten up that he wouldn't even look like a man when they were done with him. He knew it was going to happen. Isaiah prophesied it. And then he went to a cross and bled every drop of blood because he gave himself 100% for you. You think he's come back for a bride that's only given half her heart to him? You're deceived if you do. If you're sitting here right now and you say, John, truth be told, I've never given Jesus Christ my heart like a bride gives her heart to a groom. And I can't wait to do it. I want to do it right now. If that's you, that's you. You say, I'm ready. I'm ready to give them my entire life. Break up with all the old boyfriends, whatever, the, whoever they are, whatever they are. I'm ready to give him everything. Then I want you to raise your hand up high in the air. I want to pray for you this morning. Really high. Whoa, look at all the hands going up. Hey, no bride's ever been ashamed of her groom. Put him up high. Put him up really high. Now, listen, no, no bride's ever shamed of her groom. Stand to your feet if your hand's in the air. There's about 150 of you. Stand up quickly. 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 I want, uh, keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I want to make sure nobody's missed. If you are wanting to be standing right now and you're sitting, can you ask yourself what is more valuable than being separated from your creator forever in darkness forever? Ask yourself, what is more important? And make the decision. Lisa had to break up with Peter. She had to break up with Tony. She said, I want to be married to John. Now you make the decision right now. 
You decide. If he's drawing you and you're still sitting, ask yourself why. What in the world is more important? Yes, ma'am, you are worth the wait. Yes, ma'am, you are worth the wait. I want to make sure, yes, ma'am, you are worth the wait. Yes, ma'am, you are worth the wait. Four more, five more, six more. I want to make sure nobody's missed. Yes, sir, you are worth, worth the wait. Almost a dozen more people have stood up. Yes, you are worth the wait, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If you are here and you say, John, I really do have a relationship with Jesus, but I lack the fear of God and I want the fear of God. I'm willing to repent of my lack of holy fear. Let me give you symptoms. Do you, do you treat the word of God with, with a casual attitude? Do you obey God when it doesn't interfere, only when it doesn't interfere with your agenda? Do you find yourself selectively obeying? And you say, John, I, 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 I want to repent right now and I want to ask God to fill me with his holy fear. Then I want you to stand up with these people. Stand up quickly. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm looking at about 80% of the church, maybe 90. I'm so proud of you. I can tell Joe and Lori Champion are your pastors because you have a hunger for truth. I love that. All right, I want you to lift your hands up. Why am I lifting my hands up? It's an outward sign of what you're doing inwardly. You're surrendering to him. Just put them up in the air and close your eyes. I don't want you to see people that are around you. And I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Lord God, say it out loud and mean it. Lord God, please forgive me. I've lived life my way, apart from you, my creator. But today, that's all stopping. This day, March 5th, 2023, I give my spirit, soul, and body everything I am, everything I have, to you, Jesus. Jesus, you are my Lord, my eternal King, my groom, the love of my life. And now with my hands lifted, I am asking as my first request, Father, baptize me in the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. In Jesus' name. There's his presence right here, right there. He's here. Be filled. Be filled. He's here. What a beautiful presence. You know, if you could see his face right now, you wouldn't see angry, an angry look. I see his face in my heart. He's got a massive smile. His eyes are dancing with joy. But they're so strong, those eyes. There's his presence right there, right there, right there, right there. Whew. Now just say in your own words how much you love him. He loves you so deeply. You're so valuable to him, his thoughts can't even be counted that he has about you. Just say thank you. Yes. And now let's give him praise. Come on. Let's everybody stand and I want to say this, I, I hope you catch the spirit of this, but my life was changed in a service. And I remember the man who ministered, I got a hold of his book and I read the book in the Bible and the book in the Bible and the book in the Bible. And it solidified what God did in that service. I spent all last year on this message because God spoke to me and said, it is time, write it. And we had no idea what was going to begin the month that it was released the outpouring in Asbury and 15 other places in America. There's 42 chapters in this book because I, I prayed, I said, God, I don't, this is my 23rd book, but how do I, this is my life message. How do I get this message into people because they don't read nowadays? He said, do short chapters. <laughs> so there's 42 chapters. Now, if you think about it, 42 days is six weeks. So there's seven sections each section has seven chapters. 
There's six pages in each chapter except for two chapters. They're a little bit longer. And at the end of the chapter, there's a passage, a point, a ponder where I get you to ask yourself deep questions, a prayer, and a profession. Then at the end of the book in Appendix A, there's a QR code, and I did 42 videos for each chapter. The publisher said, you are going to charge for those, right? I said, no, I'm not. I want people to get this message. And so all of that in this book. Now, the thing is, you're not going to stand in line out there for hours to get a book. So I'm going to send you to Amazon because I know you're all Prime members. <laughs> and I know if I give you my, if I give you our website, this would be much better off for us financially if I sent you our website, but I'm not doing it. Because I want you to get the message. With Prime, you just hit one click and you got it tomorrow. You got to enter your credit card. You got to enter your address with our website. I don't want you doing that. I just want you to get the message. And then I want you to, if you read it and it touches you, I want you to do a Bible study with it or give it to people you love. Because I really believe there is a lack, there is a famine of the understanding of the holy awe of God. And when you understand it, you grow so much more in love with Jesus. It's so hard to explain. I'm 41, 40 years in the ministry this year, and I am more in love with him than when I started. I believe it's the fear of God. I really do, the holy awe of God. So there's the QR code. Put your phones up. Don't be embarrassed. For you older people, you don't take the picture of it. You just put your camera on it, okay? <laughs> And just, just, just get it. Hit the click and you're done. Go home, go to the restaurant, do whatever you do. But please, don't let it sit on your shelf. Please read it. Just five minutes, seven minutes every day you read the chapter, okay? I love you all so much. Please pa tell Pastor Joe that JB is a better golfer and I'll talk to you later. Come on church, let's put our hands together for Pastor John. Thank you so much for that incredible word. At this time, I would like to invite our pastors and elders down front. If you're here this morning and you have a prayer need in your life, or if you made that decision to put Christ first in your life, we wanna pray with you, we wanna get to know you, uh, we wanna know your name. And so feel free to come down forward and our team would love to pray with you. Also, as he mentioned, there, are re there is a resource table out in the concourse but it sounds like uh, Amazon is the way to go to get his books, but we do have a resource table out there. Also, ladies, I wanna remind you, our women's conference is coming up in May, so we have a radiant booth out there. If you have not gotten your ticket, feel free to go out there and get your ticket. Hey, you guys have a great Sunday afternoon, and we'll see you next Sunday.